know, it's a it's a challenge. Yeah. But I'm getting, I get through it. I love it. All right. Well, let's just jump right in. Okay. Doug. How are you, Sonia? As you said, I'm the best ever. I love your, I always feel so like pumped up when I'm talking to you because of your awesome enthusiasm. Well, it's, it's really, I'm choosing to live in that state of energetic equanimity. When did you, when did you learn to make that choice? Cause not everybody like knows to make that choice or is it's not easy to make that choice. I mean, probably maybe 20 years ago when I shifted, um, 21 years ago when I shifted my diet, I was having some really tough times and some good times. And that was about the time that I lost my mother and my father. And then I realized that every moment and this almost sounds cliche today, but that every moment was was a blessing, was a gift, and that I could not control whether or not my mother died or my father died or whether I stubbed my toe or my landlord, you know, was, you know, overly aggressive. But what I could choose was how I responded um, to that as opposed to reacting. And when I did my first Vipassana meditation, 10 days, silence, no reading, writing, speaking, eye contact, email, phone, technology, like the whole purpose of that. And that was the teaching of the Buddha. So in non-denominational, cause it's not like Buddhism, it was a technique used by the Buddha to help achieve enlightenment. And I'm far from enlightened by the way. So, but in that, the, the whole part and parcel of that was to learn about living in a state of equanimity, right? Just observing the, your clingings, your cravings and your aversions. And all I did was tweak that a little bit more to say, well, I, I'm not interested in just being flatlined, right? Cause to me, flatlined is dead. You're not six feet under, but you're not alive. So I just decided to like add some some life into some gusto into whatever I had to deal with. Cause whatever you have to do, you can't sweep things under the rug. So that's just how I've been living for 20, 21 years. I think it's interesting because sometimes people think living in a state of equanimity is being indifferent to everything when it's actually the opposite. Um, how do you think that eating plants and changing your diet helped you shift your mindset because many, many people I've talked to, including myself and my husband who are plant-based when they changed their diet, their, their brain started working differently. Why do you think that is? I think in a way it's clarity, it's energy. Like we are living beings and I'm the furthest thing from a scientist or a nutritionist or a medical doctor, but I know that when I'm consuming things that are fresh, that are ripe, that are raw, that are organic, that have this life force in them and they feel alive. And probably, um, when I made the decision, um, at organic Avenue to sell my steak, we were getting pressure to scale and to make the juice pasteurized using HPP high pressure pascalization or high pressure processing. And when I tasted that juice and I looked at that juice and I would feel the, the energy of it, it felt dead. I couldn't quantify it. But years later, when the science came out and that they were achieving a five million to one reduction in pathogens, you know, like pathogens aren't in microbes are not just all bad, right? There's good bacteria, bad bacteria, as we know in the microbiome. So I think that if you're eating processed food, um, cooked food, processed food, refined food, meat, dairy, animal products, they go into your gut. And the gut affects the brain, it affects cravings, it affects habits. And when you clean all that crap out, <laughs> right? Really? <laughs> right. You, you get all that crap out and I'm not necessarily promoting colonics and enemas. Um, but when you get all that stuff out, then all of a sudden 
you are in touch with your gut, like with your gut feeling. And so if you think about how food is digested, right? Fruit goes through the stomach into the small intestine and then gets processed and they're separating the, the liquids from the fiber and the insoluble fiber gets passed out and fiber gives you a great movement. That's a great flow. If you think about having a piece of flesh, right? What would happen if you left a, a, a piece of fish on your kitchen countertop at 98.6 degrees for 24 or 48 hours, <laughs> right? What would happen? Oh, it would smell awesome. <laughs> right, right. And it would, well, it would rot, I, grow bacteria, like all the bad things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, like it the, the maggots would start growing out of it, yeah. right? They would just start going. So if you think about when you're, when you become conscious about what you consume, you're just at another level of awareness. And I became aware when I went plant-based that everything that I put in my mouth was indeed and in fact a life or death decision, right? Very clear. And then I made the decision that I was going to raise my standards. So if I was going to consume something, right, because I needed the calories or I needed the nutrition or something, why choose something that would be low vibration, low energy, rotting or the like, why not choose the highest quality nutrition on a per calorie basis? Like it just seemed obvious to me. And so if you were to offer me gourmet ceremonial cacao that, that you made, you know, with a high quality cacao butter and shaved coconut and some turmeric and some rose petals, I'd be like, yeah, Sonia, yeah. And if, if you offered me like, you know, one of those things, I don't want to, I don't want, I'm, I'm brand uh, deco uh, decommodification right now. So I don't want to mention any brands, but one of those like chocolate things in a teardrop um, shape wrapped in some, you know, tin foil, like, like that to me looks like a Christmas ornament. Like I wouldn't want to eat that. I don't eat tennis balls. I don't eat Christmas mm -hmm. ornaments. Uh, and I choose, I don't want to have things that have added sugar, refined sugar, processed sugar. And so that just allows you to be at this kind of state of clarity. And, and that's a process. Like what you goes in, what goes in affects who you are and then goes out. So, I think that might be the connection. If you're making choices, you'll be operating at a different vibrational level. Now, I'm not saying like I, it's better because it's better for me, right? There's some high performing people, right? That still eat all this other stuff and they seem like they're really nice people. They're compassionate. They kick, they don't kick the dog. They don't beat their wife, you know, they, they pay their bills, you know, then they, they have high integrity, right? So there's possible that people of all sorts, but what I found is a level of connection when people are conscious about the environment, the animals, their neighbors, and th this whole cycle of food can affect everything that you do. And so th I think that's it. I love that. So I definitely want to spend some time talking about your background, but I think people are here because they want to hear about sprouts because a lot of people are just, oh, okay. So first of all, someone listening might not even know what a sprout is. So can you start there? Absolutely. So basically a sprout is a label for a seed that's in its early state of germination. So it's just a term, right? Uh, a sprout is a seed and a seed is a plant organism. And seeds have been around since the beginning of time and all plant life on this planet 
began with seeds. So for however many years you want to have, so I don't want to become uh, scientific or political or religious. So however many years there were of life on this planet, seeds existed and seeds for the greater portion of this time, whether it's millions or billions of years, seeds were germinated and then grew into fruit trees or vegetables and they took weeks or months or years, but they all started with seeds that were germinated. The label of sprouts is seeds that were germinated that became edible food and the greatest portion, if you were to do some research today, 80% of the sprouts in the United States are alfalfa sprouts, 20% or 19% are mung bean sprouts, and 1% are all other sprouts. And sprouts in our current vernacular are describing um, these seeds in the germination state in the zero to like one week or two week period, and those are sprouts. And when you take this seed and you create the environment for germination, which is very simple, right? It's simulating life on the planet. Like if the seed went in the soil and it became moist and it was dark, the, the seed says, aha, time to wake out of my dormant state. It's time for me to grow. So I'm going to sprout and roots and shoots will come out of the seed and the seed will burst out into life. And that seed is edible. And oh, go, keep going. Okay, so so the insight that I had was that seeds, when sprouted, are enormous amount of variety, and they're super nutritious, and they fit under the umbrella of being a vegetable. So we know that vegetables are good for you, right? We know that. I think most people, you know, there's a few, you know, corner case people. I, I haven't mm -hmm. spoken to them, but a few corner case people. But for the, the general majority says that vegetables are good for you. Fiber is good for you. Micronutrients, phytonutrients, good for you. So sprouts are something that, like, I didn't discover. I observed and made this observation that there were many more sprouts readily available beyond alfalfa and mung bean that had enormous nutritional um, qualities and were super easy to grow. And I decided to write a book called The Sprout Book to like help people understand food sovereignty, food equality, um, nutrition um, standards, and that all came to be. And so now, the, the, I think since my book came out in April, the conversation around sprouting has really percolated everywhere. Now, it's with the help of people like you and uh, some, like I, I did the Joe DeSena Spartan podcast, and I did the Rich Roll podcast, and I did the Marianne Williamson podcast, podcast, which was really powerful to be on her platform. Um, I did the wellness mama podcast and now people, you know, a lot of talk around broccoli sprouts, but also about lentils, about clover, radish, arugula, chia, flax, all of these seeds that, that have been used for since millennial can now actually be consumed as food within a week. And the other thing which is incredible is that this can be done in one cubic foot of your kitchen, right? So the smallest apartment I've ever lived in is 400 square foot apartment. My kitchen is 48 square feet. One square foot of counter space, one cubic foot creates all of this incredible, incredible nutrition. And so that was something where I, I, I felt my di discovery was the observation and that came out of necessity, right? So necessity being the greatest form of invention, I, after 
you know, my, my last company, a uh, Juicera was composted. I was living in San Francisco, walking over homeless people and drug addicts and needles on the street and like really paying a lot to be in a city that was beautiful people and some really dark things. And I said, the, the sirens would go by. I didn't realize every time there was a drug overdose, they would send a fire truck. And so the fire truck would go by and ambulances would go by and police. And I heard shootings and I had my iPhone. You know, I was, you know, warned if you're ever in a big city and you're walking down the street and you're like just holding your phone, someone can run by or buy, buy and grab your phone. So I had that experience and I was like, I'm done. Like, what am I doing here? I don't need to impress anybody. So I had this vision that I was going to be in the desert, right? Vision in the desert um, and that I, I want to live on an oasis and I want to have hot springs and I wanted to do that. Turns out like, and I'm in my, I'm in a yurt right now. This is my yurt office. Um, and I love so that. <laughs> I, I set up. So I, I, I bought like five acres of land and that had hot springs on them, right? So that hunch was real. I had hot springs. And so while I was like er, putting up the yurt, you know, I'm staying in, in a tent. I had a, like a little tent like Rich had, but that got blown away because we had big winds here. So I said, I need a real yurt. And then I was going back and forth to the nearest Whole Foods, which was in Palm Springs, which was a minimum of an hour and 15 minutes away with no traffic. And after doing that for a few days, I was like, there's no way, like this is no, like no, don't wanna be in the car, don't wanna be in traffic. And so I went into like my past memory and I remembered sprouting. And I'd been sprouting, you know, over the, the 25 year period. Right. And, but I never thought about sprouts as anything more than a superfood or a garnish or something to add to a salad or, you know, a sandwich or something. But here I was like, I need to eat, right? I need to eat. So I went online and I bought like the mung beans and I bought alfalfa sprouts. And then I got broccoli sprouts, radish sprouts, arugula sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, and, and then I, I remember sprouting chia when I was doing Organic Avenue and we had chia seed, uh, chia pudding. And then I remembered the chia pet. So I started sprouting chia and getting like one inch, two inch, like micro green chia sprouts. And then I sprouted flax and then arugula. And then I was like within a month, I was consuming 50 percent of my calories were from sprouts that I grew in maybe a little bit more than one cubic foot of my kitchen countertop. And it wasn't even the countertop because I put a bamboo dish tray over one of the basins in the sink so that it could drip out there. And I was using these half gallon glass jars and I was so sold. And then I was curious, like all people who are you know, who eat differently, right? Eat differently. I said, am I healthy? Is this healthy for me? And the more I researched, the more white papers, articles, information that I got from trusted sources, it was like thumbs up. Sprouts are good for you. They're super nutritious. They, it, they have these super compounds that in concentrations that are a multiple of the mature vegetable, and I was like, I'm sold. Yeah, that was the most interesting thing that I learned from you is the hyper concentration of nutrients and the density in sprouts. And it's really incredible because you can eat a lot of sprouts and get a crazy amount of nutrients. And if you like, we we, we always use the broccoli sprouts and broccoli example because sulforaphane is so popular and so hot right now, which it should be. But yeah, like, Tell me about the nutrient value and density in sprouts and why people should could could and should eat those over just like the vegetable after it's already been grown. I mean, here's a simple example that I like to use. If you were to take a half a cup of lentils 
and you and and by the way, lentils are good for you, right? Lentils are good for you. Um, they're a staple of many global cuisines. Lentils are good for you. If you were to take a half a cup of lentils and you sprout them, number one, you're not using any heat. You're not cooking them, so less energy. But you take the half a cup of lentils, they become at least a full cup, if not a cup and a half, right, as they grow. When they grow on an ounce per ounce basis, when they're sprouted, you're doubling the antioxidant qualities. So if they're red lentils, they have the beta carotene. If they're the darker lentils, they can have the anthocyanidins. Um, if they're green, they can have chlorophyll. Like you're doubling the antioxidants and you're tripling the vitamin C. And it's growing, you're getting more soluble and insoluble fiber while maintaining the seven grams of protein that's in a cup of lentils. So every aspect is mind boggling. And the fact that you can do that in a glass jar with some cheesecloth and some water is like, whoa, whoa, like holy, holy sprouts. Like this is, (laughs) this is really powerful. Yeah. So the simplicity of sprouting is something that's really amazing. And a lot of times people say, well, I don't know how to do it or I'm terrible. I kill cactus. Like I can't do it. Can you walk us through the start to finish of a week long sprouting process? Yeah. So it's, it's really, and first of all, by, by the way, I will walk you through this. I wrote the book on sprouts called the sprout book and I made charts in the book and I evaluated different sprouting techniques. So whether you're using a jar or a tray or a bag or soil or a alternative sprouting medium, like a piece of unbleached paper towel or coconut husk or cheesecloth. So I went through all of those and it turns out there's a different technique for almost every sprout, although some can fall into a family. But I'll take, since you said broccoli sprouts are hot, we'll talk about broccoli sprouts right now. And I'll do the best I can to walk through this process. I would take a quart or half gallon jar. And I like the half gallon jars because it's the same work to do the half gallon as it is to do the, the, the quart. So in your country, two liters versus one liter, close enough. Um, but you take two tablespoons of broccoli seeds, very important to me, and I encourage people to use organic broccoli seeds that were sold for the purpose of sprouting not just random ones from the garden store or the bulk bin. Can I, I would interrupt? Get... What's the difference? Sure. What's the difference between the sprouting seeds and then the seeds sold just like that you at the grocery store? I think the sprouting seeds are tested for pathogens. So they are uh, uh, gone through a process knowing that you're going to be sprouting these, you're going to have them raw. Um, so they're tested for pathogens. And number two, they're tested for the high germination rate. So you can have germination rates from flat line zero to as high as like 90, high 90% germination rate. So if you were to get old seeds out of a bulk bin that weren't tested for germination rate and not pathogens that were designed for cooking, they may not sprout. They may have um, toxins on them and you know, if you were to cook them, you wouldn't have a problem. But if you sprout them, it they, they wouldn't give you the desired results. Okay, great. Thank you. Pleasure. And keep interrupting me. I've got incredibly tough skin, as you know. <laughs> um, so, um, so you take the two tablespoons of these broccoli sprout seeds. You put them into the glass jar. You add spring water or filtered water to them so that they're at least two or three times the amount of water to the seeds. Then you swirl them around 
so that all the seeds are wet and they'll absorb water and they'll sink. And the ones that don't sink probably won't, um, won't sprout. So you might want to eliminate those. And then you put them, you know, away from the light under the countertop in a cupboard under the sink, you could throw a towel over them and you let them sit overnight or depending on the seed in the broccoli case, I'll use a standard eight hours, let them soak overnight and the water is absorbing. Um, the seed is absorbing the water and it's getting geared up, ready to sprout. And the outer shell, the testa of the seed is softening and it's getting ready to come alive. So you're activating the germination process. Then you take the jar and you, they, they sell these special lids that have, that are porous or perforated or screens. You could put that on, or you could just take a piece of cheesecloth and a rubber band, put that over the jar, drain out the extra water, add some new water, drain it out again and leave the jar, um, at a 45 degree angle, you don't want to do it fully upside down because you want to make sure that the seeds don't cover the entire entrance because you want airflow to come in and you want water to drip out. So that's an important distinction. And then twice a day, you do that process. Like twice a day, morning at night, the seeds are pretty forgiving and you want to do that in ambient temperature. Um, and we live in a very, you know, processed world in the desert. Um, I have to put them in the greenhouse where I have a swamp cooler to keep the, the temperature um, a little cooler or they will die. Um, but normal everyday kitchen temperature is fine in most places of the world. Um, if they're drying out more because you're in the, the, the dry desert and you can rinse them a third time, won't hurt them. Then um, on day two and day three, they're growing, growing, growing. And I've posted a lot on broccoli sprouts on my Instagram, the at Doug Evans, you could see. And then on day five, very edible. Day six, very edible. Day seven, important. Again, on your last stage, if you're growing, those two tablespoons of seeds will grow six cups of broccoli sprouts. So six cups, I mean, amazing growth from them. I like to eat at least one cup or two cups a day of the broccoli sprouts because they're fiber, they're vitamin C and they have the glucoraphanin and which is the precursor to the sulforaphane. So since they're so inexpensive and they're vegetable, I don't know if more is better for you. But to me, it's just a vegetable and just so happens to have that. And I want to make sure I'm getting the minimum amount of that in my body. And then the final stage is you leave them after you rinse them, your final stage, let them dry out for another like eight hours or overnight because you do not want to put damp things to wet things in the refrigerator. You may even take them out and put them in a, um, in a paper towel or a cloth. I'm, I I'm reticent to say paper towel cause we're doing the best we can to be zero waste, you know, here on the reservation. But, um, we, we bought these bamboo paper towels. They come in a roll. They're, you're supposed to be able to use each one a hundred times each. So we'll see how that goes, but get something to get off any extra moisture and then um, you can store them in the refrigerator and they'll last for several days. And how do you know if the sprout has gone bad? Because I think people freak out about sprouts like, oh, it's going to grow bacteria and I'm going to get sick. Well, I was just um, doing some research and my research associate um, came back to me because I asked, I said, oh, um, I know Sonia is going to ask me this question. <laughs> so the odds of getting um, foodborne illness from consuming a sprout and a per serving is about one in 26 million. So I don't know what those odds are, but one in 26 <laughs> million. Um, 
you could probably win something in lottery before you could um, have that. Um, but I think that the the process of if you follow the instructions, you're using the right seeds. Uh, I I feel for me it's safe and consumable. Yeah, and it's super simple. It's cheap. It's really not that time consuming. Like there's really no reason why you shouldn't do it. There, you just should do it. Period. And it's good for you. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the the thing is, if you don't like the taste, add tahini to it, right? Because tahini masks everything. You can, you know, take an avocado mash, right? Adding sprouts to guacamole. And look, I put 40 recipes in my book of what to do with the sprouts. But if you were to ask me, like, what's the future? The future is, People are going to be adding sprouts to every meal. They're going to be, like right now, my Instagram, you know, every day I'm getting more and more ideas. Like I've learned more from the collective consciousness in the community than I knew before I wrote the book. But I love people adding sprouts to their overnight oats, adding sprouts to their cereals, adding sprouts to their salads, adding sprouts to the smoothies, people replacing protein powders with growing organic green pea sprouts and adding that to their smoothie, um, sprouting spelt, all these things are just, you know, people are juicing sprouts, which are incredible. So I, I'm excited about people being aware of a sprouts can be a garnish or sprouts can be a whole meal. What's the most unusual thing that you've sprouted? You know, I've sprouted coconut and huh. coconut is actually not a nut. A coconut is a seed. And when you sprout the coconut, the inside fills up with this white, fluffy, feels like cotton candy. It's a totally different um, experience than eating the hard aged old coconut. So I'd say that coconut. Is there something that you shouldn't sprout? Like there are there types of plants that are just a no, no kidney beans, kidney beans, like there's something in the kidney bean that they shouldn't be consumed raw. So if you're going to eat kidney beans, you can sprout them, but then you need to cook them. So that's don't eat them raw. So let's ask, I want to ask you about sprouts versus shoots versus microgreens because microgreens were really popular. It seems like a few years ago. And then at the farmer's market, you see like shoots, like pea shoots, sunflower shoots. What's the difference? I think branding. So it's, really. all, the same, it's all the same stuff. I mean, you know, look, I think when you're sprouting in a jar, um, because the, you're rolling and then tumbling in the jar, they don't become straight, right? If you're using a tray, so all microgreens are grown in a tray and they grow vertical and because they're a plant and they're green and they're going through the process of photo, photosynthesis, they're going straight up and they're green and they're pretty and they, you know, they look like a mini row crop mm -hmm. in it. I've taken um, shoots like sunflower sprouts, which are normally like really a micro green. And I've been sprouting them in a jar because it's easy for me. I don't want to deal with the, you know, the, the paper towel or the soil or the sprouting medium. And they get about half the size of the micro green shoot, but they're very, um, they're, they're still edible and they're nutritious and the seeds are so inexpensive that I'm happy to eat them on day three or day five and not let them grow to the mature. I think the pea shoots the same thing. Like you can eat the green pea in its round form, the little tail, or you can let the shoot come up and grow to three inches, four inches, five inches. Um, but microgreens is a relatively new term, probably less than 30 years old. And when I think of microgreens, and by the way, I love microgreens. When I think of microgreens, those are generally used in, in the culinary as like an add-on and they're cutting things and they're using smaller amounts. I'm thinking of food, right? I'm thinking about like in LA, people are, you know, stabbing people over toilet paper right now. So imagine what will happen when people are concerned with food. So I'm thinking about food. And so from a level of 
of volume and density and ease. Sprouts are, you know, in the jar method is you can grow more sprouts faster and have more food. So I look at sprouts as food. Yeah, and it, it seems like when you're eating sprouts, you're eating like the seed was previously there and you ate it. Whereas if you're eating shoots, a lot of times it's like cut off the tops. So you're not actually eating the original seed or is that, is that true or? Yeah. Well, that, that's also true. Like if you're, and, and I love the, the dialogue, you're really helping me with my explanations. So generally the, when you're sprouting, if you're sprouting, you eat the whole thing except maybe the sunflower shell, right? The black shell you don't eat. But when you're growing in the soil, you, you have to trim and slice and cut. Also, uh, the microgreens, um, as they're growing, um, generally you're adding a fertilizer or you're adding a soil. And some people are using UV lights to grow them. And it's just more of a process and it takes longer. And what I want is to get to the food as fast as possible in the most affordable way. And have you thought about like the nutrients in the soil that the seed will take whenever it starts growing versus growing them in a jar without any type of soil? It, it turns out that the, the way nature designed the seed, the seed has within it everything it needs to go from zero to hero in a week. Beyond that week, it then needs the soil or the fertilizer or the minerals to continue to grow. And, and I think that was my, my distinction that cause I was hungry. I wanted to start being able to eat it as soon as possible. So that was where I stayed with the jars and I stayed with the sprouting. Um, but you'll see, I've did a lot of posts with a lot of trays and I I'll use a tray in particular. I'm growing when I'm doing wheatgrass or sunflower sprouts and I want them taller and beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll do the microgreen sprouting method tray. And there's a whole chapter, like I go through in the book, how to grow things in the tray, which, um, those will be microgreens. There's been some listener questions from my plant powered Academy Facebook group. And one of the questions someone asked is they're curious uh, about the quantity and how often they should be eating, which we did talk about, but they also want to know if variety matters. So like how much variety yeah. should you eat? I think diversity of plant-based is huge. Like I think that you want to get as much variety as you can, which is one of the reasons why I, I increased my variety away from the things that I was doing, which was the alfalfa and the mung bean. Then I added sunflower, then I added the chia and then the flax and then exotic things like the fenugreek. So I think variety is huge. Um, but it's important not to get overwhelmed. Start small, finish big. That's awesome. And can you mix different types of seeds in one jar? Or Because you did mention there's different ways of sprouting um, depending on the type of seed. Is it bad to mix them all together in a jar? I think there's definitely different kinds of seeds, right? There's the gelatinous seeds, the arugula, the flax, and the chia. And there's the garden variety, like the alfalfa and the broccoli and the radish, those will grow together. So I think that certain things will grow together and certain things won't. Um, the, a lot of like most of the legumes, you know, the azuki, the peas, the lentils, the, the chickpeas, garbanzo beans, they'll all grow at a relatively good pace. So I, I think if you do them in sections, they're fine. But you wouldn't want to mix a chia, a broccoli seed, and a sunflower seed. And what about eating the sprouted beans? Because people are very concerned with gas. Like, even when they're not eating beans, they're worried about gas. But they're saying, oh, I'm going to eat, like, a sprouted bean. Do I need to cook it? How do I eat that? I think there's a lot of research on the consuming of legumes as part of the plant-based diet around the world. I think when you're sprouting a legume, you're reducing the phytic acid, you're removing the enzyme inhibitors, you're getting more soluble and insoluble fiber. It will take a little time for your microbial colonies to be able to, to thank you 
um, for consuming this. And so in the beginning, like anything else, you know, you're a world champion, you know, athlete. Um, if I want to be an athlete like you, I'm not going to go out there and try to, you know, pedal, you know, a hundred kilometers on my first day. Right. So you have to build up to it. And I think if you build up to it, um, you, and, and this is for everyone to know, I think pretty much everyone like will flatulate 10 or 20 times a day, no matter what you eat. Like yeah, it's period. just, you need to period. <laughs> it, and some people are better at hiding it. And some people's, you know, have more foul odors and the like. Um, but I think that the gassiness can come from not properly chewing them and not having the, the right microbes um, in them. But I think sprouts are very good prebiotic. And um, I, I don't think too much of that. I also wanted to ask you about like whenever you buy sprouted whole grain, like stuff in, in, in packages, sprouted whole grain bread, sprouted, you could buy like sprouted lentils before you cook them. Like, is that still beneficial? Absolutely. I think when you're sprouting and you're going through that process, you are activating the enzymatic structure and you're shifting the state of it to make it more bioavailable, more nutritious. So I'm all for um, everything sprouted. And what's your favorite sprout recipe right now? <laughs> I like, the, we, we have, I have it in the book. It's like the, you know, we have a green smoothie, um, part and, um, did I send you a, a, a hard copy of the book or a mm -hmm. PDF of the book? I have a hard copy. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So you have a hard copy like that. The green, the green smoothie recipe is really good because it's green, right? Green is good. So that's my, my favorite one. And then I also am the hugest proponent of adding tahini and um, various herbs to any sprout. Like you can just start off the ratio of 20% tahini, 80% sprouts. And then as you become more familiar, you can probably cut the tahini down to like 5%, 4%. 3%. And it would be interesting for you to make your own tahini using sprouted sesame seeds. Ooh, getting fancy. <laughs> yeah, living foods. So what have you learned since about sprouting since you wrote the book? Because we chatted on the phone the other day and you said, oh, I've learned so much since I wrote the book. I, I learned that it was even easier than I thought, right? That was one thing, because I even had my own a little aversion to it. It was easier than I thought. I learned that the nutritional qualities were beyond what I could fathom. And that the, the research, which I thought by this time would catch up to it, but I realized like we are still at almost first base in doing the research. And so there's been a lot of research on the cruciferous family of vegetables and the broccoli sprouts, but by and large, most of the other seeds and sprouts do not have adequate or even preliminary research to go beyond them as a healthy vegetable source. And so that was like driving me and very compelling to me to think about like, wow, more research needs to be done. And not that we're talking about safe or not safe, but more research to help people understand it, to use it even better. So right now, the, we just have to look at sprouts as, you know, mini versions of the vegetables. But we know that the, the journey of from seed to mature vegetable, there's a lot of variation in that. I'm going to shift gears and, a little bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing was... Um, there's a lot of closet sprouters, <laughs> like a lot, a lot of people like who you never, ever would have suspected are sprouters are like sheepishly raising their hands or throwing their hands in the air and like, I sprout, I sprout, I love sprouts. My mother sprouts, I sprout. I mean, hearing that like, um, Joe DeSena from Spartan was talking about his mother, you know, was sprouting in, in you know, in New York city, when he was growing up, like that was, um, like I learned that, right. I learned 
more things. And so a lot about people sprouting of all, all, all sizes, um, cultures and the like that people like sprouts. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think people are secretly sprouting and not talking about it? You know, it's interesting. I interviewed, um, for my book, Dean Ornish and Joel Furman and Mark Hyman and Dr. Axe and Dr. Mercola and Dr. Joel Kahn and Dr. Alan Goldhammer and all these people, they all love sprouts. And, and some of them are like ketogenic diet and functional medicine diet and plant-based. Um, and they all like sprouts. And so I think that it just has never been a topic or a thing to talk about. They, they, were like, they were just doing it because it resonated with them and what they viewed as high quality nutrition, but the, it wasn't a focus. Like any one of those medical professionals could have written a book on sprouting and put it out into the universe but it was always part of their thesis. It wasn't the whole thing. And that's where, when, when I pulled it together, I saw that there was this common theme across many different people and experts and cultures that sprouting was a thing. And, and what I'm seeing, and I can really see it, like um, health food has gone through waves. There's been the cacao wave and the maca wave and the matcha wave and the... Um, the um, reservatrol wave and the chia wave. Um, and there will be the sprout wave, but the sprout wave will turn into the ocean. It will not, it will just continue to grow and grow because there's nothing fatty about the sprouts. Like sprouts will be here to stay and sprouts will become a new food category like seeds and grains and sprouts, right? And meat, dairy, chicken, sprouts. Like sprouts will become considered a food source. So whenever you wrote this book, a lot of times whenever people are even shifting gears in their life or creating pieces of content, whether it's a book or a video, they have imposter syndrome and they think, well, I'm not a doctor or I'm not a writer like, how am I even going to write this? How, how, how do I even know that people want to hear from me? Did you experience that? And how did you overcome that? I actually wrote about that in my book. At one point in my book, like writing the book, I wanted to just stop, give back the advance and just go do something else. Like I was like, I'll just continue to sprout for myself. This is too hard. Like I hit the wall when, when writing the book, I, I hit the wall. And then, you know, I have a lot of um, supportive people around me and they all were like, no, Doug, you can do this. Like you can do this. Like you're more passionate about sprouts than anyone I know. All information exists in the universe and is available to anyone who seeks it with earnest desire. So all I needed to do was take a deep breath, define the problem, do the homework, tap into that genius expert, dietitian, MPH, medical doctor, PhD, and I don't have to be them. I need to like harness their energy, their knowledge, etc. So I got through that wall and then I realized I'm doing the work, right? I'm doing the work. I set up my lab. I was doing the sprouting. I was congruent and living and working and eating the lifestyle and that um, no one else was going to write it. And this information was too important for me to let my lack of ego or self-esteem, you know, do it that I just said, I'm going to do it. I will do it. I'm going to white knuckle it and uh, I'm just going to make it happen. And I mean, you've, you've had multiple businesses and whenever you start a business, you kind of have to do that as well. And also when you're riding the wave of the business and what happens to it, it's a kind of a white knuckle ride. What advice do you have for people who, um, maybe are going through something difficult and uh, actually maybe talk about what happened with just Ju Juicero really briefly, and then give people some advice on like, how do you dust yourself off and keep going whenever things get really hard? 
Yeah, look, I mean, I had a I had a huge vision, right? I'd been making juice professionally for 20 years, for for over 10 years, right? I knew how to make cold pressed juice. Cold pressed juice is you take fresh produce, you you wash it, you dice it, slice it, chop it, shred it, put it into a cheesecloth bag, and then you squeeze it out. Whether you wring it with your hands or you put it in a press or somehow you need to separate using a mesh the juice from the fiber. So I saw the difference between a juice press and a normal centrifugal juicer. It was very clear to me cold press juicing was higher quality, less oxidation, and by using that two-stage process versus putting the produce in the centrifugal, which was a grinder, and you were whipping out the juice and getting a relatively low yield and oxidized juice. So I knew the difference, and we built a business where we sold a lot of cold-pressed juice and glass bottles, and I knew about that. When I started um, my next chapter of my life, I was missing green juice. Like I was used to having green juice as a, the main source of hydration as an alternative to water. And I saw that the U.S. Dietary Guidelines recommended 7 to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And so they also considered fresh juice to be a serving. So I was like, wow, what an easy way to get people to have another serving of fruits and vegetables um, in, in the juice form. And I also knew the difference between added sugar and um, sugar, naturally occurring sugar that occurs in fruits and vegetables. So I knew that. And then I saw making juice at home was a difficult, arduous process, buying the produce, washing the produce, making the juice, cleaning the juicer. And it was a, it was a oh, process. It's, a pain. it's such a pain. So, so I said, not everybody in the country is in New York City or L.A. where they have access to a, a juice bar on every corner that how can we make organic cold pressed juice available? I also saw that people who had a home juicer were using it once or twice a month, but people at an espresso machine were using it once or twice a day. And so that was my design intention. Like, could I design, could I invent, could I create a juicer that someone could literally use as quickly as an espresso machine? And turns out that that was possible but only if you did all of the work for them to create this magical experience. And that was so far beyond the realm of my possibility of me running a little lemonade stand juice bar chain in New York City to invent hardware, software, packaging, food science, recipe development, like all the engineering part. So I won't go there. There's a lot written, but I, I, I just felt like what I do now with Sprouts, like this needed to happen. So I figured out a way to build a prototype. I figured out a way to raise capital. I figured out a way to hire 50 engineers, 12 PhDs, nine food scientists to solve all of these problems. We launched the machine. The people who I cared about loved the machine. They used the machine. They bought the machine by the thousands and we sold a million packs. And because we raised so much money, there was, the stakes became very high and you're now in like a wall street finance, Silicon Valley thing where the money becomes really relevant. People don't realize like companies like Uber today are still losing $11 million a day, right? So in Silicon Valley, it's high stakes. That's where Apple was birthed, Google was birthed, Facebook was birthed, like a lot of things, Amazon was birthed and companies lose money in the beginning stages and they, they invent things. And so I'm in that track, which was totally foreign to me. And I was learning as quickly as I could. And then they said, Doug, we think we can get a new CEO in here who's an expert and he ran a billion dollar business and blah, blah, blah. And so we went through that process and I was like, okay, I, hey guys, I was the most agreeable, like normally I was very 
And then we had some, and that was kind of made no sense to me because they were saying you could squeeze the pack by hand. And of course you could, could squeeze the pack by hand. If you couldn't squeeze the pack by hand, you are making cold press juice. Hang on. I think our connection is getting a little bit. Warm. Sonia. Oh, okay. There. Is it back there? We're, I think we're back. Okay. So, um, so the, they wrote an article that you could squeeze the pack by hand. And my insight was, of course, you could squeeze the pack by hand. If you couldn't squeeze the pack by hand, there wouldn't be fresh produce in it. The same way you could pour hot water over an espresso pod and get coffee. And that, that article just became an attack on me personally as this vegan elitist who raised a lot of money. So, you know, they build you up, they tear you down. And within months, they shut the company down. And like, how do you dust yourself off? I knew that we sold thousands of machines. I knew that the people who had the machine loved it, used it nine times a week. And so we solved the design intention. I felt terrible that people lost money. I felt terrible that employees, you know, had their dreams and their bubbles bursted. That was terrible. And I felt terrible that people who had the machine who were using it had to send it back because um, it was not working. And, you know, there was no it was it was over. So I just said, look, this was a journey that I, I learned a lot on that I could do better on and that I was going to apply these messages and these lessons to my future life. And I wasn't going to hide like I was just saying, OK, I did my best. Maybe I would do some things differently or the like. But I felt really good that I achieved many of my goals in it. Like if I were to assess it, we did many, many, many things right and a few things wrong. And I never would have imagined that there was um, a, a lack of integrity in so many different pockets of, of the world. And I never, I wasn't big on social media before. So I never like understood trolls and haters and like that just didn't make, like I never experienced before. And the, I felt the, the amount of vitriol and the amount of like, um, like arrows and daggers that were directed towards me was incomprehensible. But to me, I was like, wow, these people have no idea what they're talking about. Like they're just misinformed. And if I only had the information that they had, I may have agreed with them. So they're just all misinformed. And when I taught my Harvard Business School case, caselet in January of 2020, the, the entire class was all misinformed. So they all came in with this bias that like the thing was a fake and I was a phony and why were they even bringing me here? And then when they left, they're like, oh, oh, we get it. Oh, I get it. Oh, that makes sense. So it's all part of history, but I didn't feel like necessary to, to defend myself or to be expository. I was just like, oh, okay, you guys making decisions, this is happening. And then, you know, I, you know, sprouts were handed to me in another dream. When I thought about that, when I moved to the desert, I knew that magic was going to happen in the desert. And turns out sprouts were a much better like place for me. So it's hard to go back and say, oh, like, I'm glad that Juicero was gone. I'm glad that I got fired and all those things. Like, I'm not going to say that because it doesn't make sense, but. I love where I am today and I love the message that I have today and the, the, the possibility of what this represents. Yeah. I think that's so important to be able to look at things that have happened, whether it be like a, a failed relationship or maybe like a failed business or, or anything. And you said focusing on all the things that went well, because not, not everything is just dismal and every single thing didn't go, didn't go well. Like, 
everything that you've done in your life, period, even if you're not doing it anymore, makes you who you are today. And if you can learn to, I mean, and it's, it's important to feel the pain, right? Not just pretend it's not there, but to sit there and like even journaling, write down all the positive things that have come out of something that maybe didn't have a positive outcome, like or the outcome you desired. And I've done that with relationships actually, where I might still be deeply hurt by yeah. somebody, but I still got a lot out of the relationship. It's just that it's just not the right relationship anymore. And the same goes in business. Yeah, well, look, I think the fact that I met you was one of my Juicero successes. We never would have met, never would have met or hadn't met before Juicero. And now we met. And so that is an upside, right? Mm -hmm. So so there's people that I met along the way on that journey who I care about, who I still have relationships with that I may not have had otherwise. So I think it's so important to count your successes along the way and not be kind of mired because as, as you, as an athlete, I love the adage that says it's not the mountains that hold you back. It's the pebble in your shoe. <laughs> and right now, if I get a pebble in my shoe, I stop and get that pebble out like immediately. Right. I try, I don't try to like run it off. I, I want to be, you know, in this state and a lot of benefits and count the blessings um, that, that happened. All right. Well, I think we had an awesome podcast. There's so much information and even like good life advice for people. Where can people buy your book and where can people connect with you to get more Doug Evans awesomeness? I would say, um, Instagram today at Doug Evans, D O U G E V A N S dot, uh, just Doug Evans. And, and my book is called the sprout book and it's available literally wherever books are sold. So most people are buying from Amazon. I would say, you know, go to your local bookseller. If you have a store and try to support them, tell them to order it. And I tell them I'm happy to zoom in and, and do a, a, a live with them if they want to get people, you know, there talking about sprouts. And I'd love to see sprout clubs popping up all around the world where people are sharing their information, their knowledge and their sprouts. Awesome. Well, thanks for your authenticity and your enthusiasm and your warmth. And it shows up in your work. It shows up in your social media. It shows up in just how you speak. And I really appreciate you. And I am so thankful that you came on the show. Okay. My pleasure. Take care. Look forward to talking to you soon. Bye-bye.